welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bob Zarrell. With me, as always, is professional film critic, Sean Patrick. Visit us at IHateCritics.net, Everyone's a Critic Podcast.com as well. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Our handle there is Critics Pod. Uh, listen to the show at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Alexa, all your podcatchers. Subscribe to the show, rate and review the show, give us five stars, we'll read your review on the air, and we will have Blu-rays for you to, uh, if you're the next one to do it. I think the next one is I Spit on Your Grave. Uh, a nice 4K uh, anniversary package. Yep. And if you want to hear us talk about that, head over to patreon.com slash criticspod. Uh, it's the best way to help support the podcast, get yourself a credit on the show. And then we are at T Public. If you go to tpublic.com and search Critics Pod, you'll find us, or go to ihatecritics.net. Click on the T Public link to get some of our podcast merch. Uh, my son all of a sudden has been a, like infatuated with Willem Dafoe, more so because of the new Spider Man movie. He's like, has, right. he, has he been in any other movies? I'm like, I got two shirts with him on it. <laughs> uh, uh, so I someday we'll go down that rabbit hole, start with Last Temptation, and then <laughs> <laughs> move on to Body of Evidence. There you go. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and you got to work yourself up to that uh, Lars von Trier movie. Right. I still <laughs> haven't seen yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but before we get into the show, some stuff... A lot of things that happened over the weekend. First and foremost, uh, yesterday, during not during the Super Bowl, but it was announced kind of during the Super Bowl that I noticed it anyway, that Ivan Reitman had passed, uh, director of Ghostbusters and Twins and all sorts of, I don't know why he went to Twins, but several <laughs> movies. Uh, yeah. Father of Jason Reitman, uh, who's a great director in his own right. Uh, yeah, 75, sad one of the last things he did was, uh, I don't know, he was there uh, and actually got to call cut on a couple of scenes on on uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife. He was there with his son, and that was uh, a lovely little tribute, you know, to his dad, which is you know pretty pretty sweet when you think about it. And I believe the uh, the Blu-ray has a has a lovely tribute to him as well. He was alive when he did it, but uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. It's been a while; we haven't seen it. He's not directed anything since 2014. Uh, his last uh, directorial effort was Draft Day with Kevin Costner, which wasn't a bad movie. Uh, but it's been a while since he directed anything that anybody really loved. Like, uh, I would say Kindergarten Cop would be the last time anybody really loved something he did. He made a lot of other movies like Six Days, Seven Nights, Father's Day, Junior were especially pretty bad. But uh, I still have a soft spot for Evolution with uh, <laughs> with David Duchovny, yeah. which I know a lot of people hate, but I, I just I do have a soft spot for that movie. It's just so silly. Well, he was he made more than anything watchable movies. You know, he yeah. wasn't trying to rewrite the, you know, you know, reinvent the wheel. He was just making good, fun, and watchable movies, and uh, you either loved them or you didn't. That's usually how watchable movies work. Uh, you know, there's really nothing special about Ghostbusters, but for whatever reason, I just, it's one of the most fun movies ever to watch. Uh, <clears throat> even Twins, for a long time, you know, I got away from it, and then going back, it wasn't as much fun as uh, when I was younger. But uh, he just really does make watchable movies, and uh, th- that's something not a lot of people can do. You know, you look at someone like someone we talked about last week, Roland Emmerich, who you would that's what he wants to do. <laughs> Yeah. I, well, I shouldn't say. I think he is thinks he is reinventing the wheel. But regardless, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that. Uh, I'm not trying to say he should have died instead. That's not where I'm going. <laughs> uh, I just, but he made some classics, uh, especially for me as a kid. So it is kind of yeah. sad. And uh, but yeah, I don't certainly, it's really notable. And you know, his his son is uh, you know, creating a, his own legacy in a very you know wonderful way and uh the, you know that's a great legacy for ivan to have is that he came that he gave birth to this kid you know that he and his wife uh, brought this kid into the world who's making great art now and uh that's always something that he can he can go away proud of proud with and uh yeah. obviously the ghostbusters you know is that's his thing you know 
the cast obviously gets a lot of credit as well, but it was his baby, you know? Right. He, he tied it all together. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, just sad news. Uh, and then also, uh, the Oscar nominations came out last week. Anything, any shocks, anything that surprised you? I was bummed about Nicholas Cage. I get a lot. I get one of my tweets actually went viral a little bit. Uh, because I said, said that Nicholas Cage got robbed and people were you know, retweeting and sharing that a lot. And yeah, he was, he was robbed. That was the best performance by any actor last year. I would absolutely say that, it, that it's not only on par with what Benedict Cumberbatch did and what, uh, you know, what Denzel did in, in his movie. And obviously it's way better than anything Javier Bardem did in that awful Ricardo's movie that got <laughs> multiple nominations. That piece of crap. <laughs> but again, it's about the it's about the movies that it really is about the movies that the largest majority of a of a group of people can coalesce around as opposed to the actual best movie. And that's really that's why Belfast is gonna win Best Picture. And I, and it sounds like I'm bagging on Belfast. I'm not. It's just that Belfast is a movie that's very easy to like. And uh although if people watch Death of the Nile, maybe they won't be maybe they won't be able to say. <laughs> could be could be his Norbit uh, <laughs> on a uh, preview of what's coming up. Uh, that or even West Side Story is the same kind of thing. Power of the Dog gets the most nominations and has a chance. I mean, they did vote for Moonlight this group, so there's something there's there's something there. Sometimes they actually picked the best movie in the category. Sometimes. They never picked the best movie. We yeah, know that. Right. <laughs> because no movie we've ever voted for has even been nominated. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah I, I can't even think of like of, of the movies that we've mentioned. Uh, I think Arrival maybe got nominated for Best Picture. Uh, did it? I don't remember for sure. Yeah, I don't. That was. it's If, if there was one, that's the most likely. Right. Because Gone Girl didn't get it. None of the no. Ari Aster movies did. Llewellyn Davis didn't. Yeah, I think pre-podcast Les Mis was the last one that you really pushed for that got that got nominated, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, but you also notice we stopped covering the Oscars on the show, <laughs> too. <laughs> so, uh, and, you know, everybody comes to me and goes, why, why movies? Why not TV? TV's so much better now. And I'm like, you're just you're talking blockbuster movies, you know, the, those, the indie movies with the directors, they get to do what they want. Those movies are still as good or better than anything, any form of, you know, moving picture, uh, art right now, better than TV, better than blockbusters. It, it's as good as it gets. I mean, both you and I have Midsummer and Hereditary near the top of our all time list, and those are fairly Absolutely. new movies. Not to mention all the other A twenty four movies that are also creeping up there. Uh, I really think it's a great time to be a movie viewer. It's just Absolutely. We, we just have to sort through some more shit than we normally don't have to sort through. You specifically, you usually get to skip <laughs> some of these straight to D V D movies that now you can't tell what's good and what's bad other than Yeah. Yeah, I'm having that experience. <sighs> At these, but then uh, you know, but then I get Nocturna and uh, you know, Beyond the Infinite Two Minutes. And it's like these are movies that, without COVID, maybe I never see. Or H is for Happiness. We got to go back a couple of years. Oh yeah, or that baseball movie last year. Uh, yeah, Giants being lonely. Yeah. So anyway, let's jump into our show, and I will. Oh crap! I haven't done that part yet. Hold on. <laughs> got to get the pictures up here. <laughs> Sorry, I told Sean to be ready at between six and six thirty, and he from now on he should really just start looking at that second number. Ah, <laughs> uh, where are we at? All right, share screen, preview, share, maximize, and we will start with where you were foreshadowing earlier: death on the <laughs> Nile. Death on the Nile uh, stars Kenneth Branagh as Hercule Poirot, the uh, Agatha, Christi Agatha Christie created character who is a world famous detective. He's uh, on his second adventure because the, the first one of uh, the, the bullet train movie that he made was pretty good. 
that was a pretty terrific uh, mystery. It had a lot of really interesting characters and nice twists and turns. It was a lot of fun. This one is completely the opposite, although it's more opulent, even more opulent than the first and even more expensive looking than the first. It has, you know, as bigger, a bigger cast. Uh, it's bad in, in ways that, uh, the ways they're, I don't know, just the characterizations are just all off. And it starts with Gal Gadot, who is an actress I really like, but she's just making a lot of weird choices. And she's kind of seeming like, more and more of a weird person coming through than a weird actor. Because you get this impression of her outside of her acting that she's kind of she's kind of odd. And that's kind of creeping through. Like as she gets more and more power and more, becomes more and more of a star, she becomes less and less down to earth and more odd. And the character she plays here is supposed to be you know, this very rich, very accomplished woman, but she comes off as just like a space alien. <laughs> I think touch. that's all. Yeah. Like, and granted, that's your rich. Most rich people are in that way. <laughs> At a certain point, you get so rich that you become essentially alien to the regular people, but she's just becoming, it, it's the acting is just not, there it feels like the person is coming through she's the kind of actor who needs a stronger hand as a director and you would think kenneth branagh as an actor would be that kind of uh that kind of director but he's really more of an actor's director he wants these actors to do the kind of actorly things that he enjoys doing so he wants to give them all sorts of freedom to find their performance and in doing that and giving her that much leeway she kind of almost borderline humiliates herself with this rather over the top performance. It's that it just is not, it just doesn't work in any way. But then everybody seems just a little bit off. Everybody in the movie, Army Hammer seems just a little bit off. Uh, just everybody in the film <laughs> is just. Do they sing Imagine? Thankfully, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the the mystery isn't very good. You know, it, it's not very hard to deter. I figured it out pretty quickly. Which again, this this isn't so much of a problem if you've got a cast that is interesting enough. It doesn't matter how predict how predictable your movie is. We're, we're going to get to that a little later on, uh, where again you have a very pl- predictable plot, but because the cast is so good, you don't even notice. Like some people could say that Gone Girl has a pre- predictability to it, but it's so good in its construction and its cast that it wouldn't matter if you were able to figure out what was going on too quickly. Right. It's just well, that, it's just that level of brilliant. You're pulled exactly. in and you're not even thinking about words. You're just, you're along for the ride. You forget to think about how it's going to, you know, how it's going to twist or end. Uh, and this, this feels like a cartoon crossed with like a daytime drama, like a soap opera. And it's just, that's not, <laughs> it's not a very conducive atmosphere for great tension, yeah. suspense and mystery. Scooby Doo meets Days of Our Lives. <laughs> yeah, with Scooby as the mustache. Yeah. <laughs> Gal Gadot is scrappy. Is, is there any worry that she's Henry Cavill? I'm I'm starting to wonder. I'm starting to wonder. Um, I'm starting to wonder if she's just kind of getting uh, getting in her head a little bit about how big a star she is, and that. Uh, Maybe she's not taking direction as well as she did with Patty Jenkins of the original Wonder Woman. You know, you got to have a director who can direct people and uh, without a strong hand to guide a performance. I'm starting to wonder if she's going to end up in the the same place that a lot of actors of that type end up where they they just keep making the same movies and getting a little bit more and more out of touch every day. But you keep getting those paychecks and that's all that matters to some. Anyway, <laughs> anything else on Death of the Nile, or should we move on? It's a real big disappointment. It is it is really bad, and, and shockingly so, considering he's such a great director and such a talented actor. And he directed this, too, or just started in it? Yeah, he directed this. Really? Yeah. Wow. All right, let's move on to Marry Me. The- Marry Me is a Don't shockingly so. good movie. God damn it. I should have watched it. <laughs> what? Well, I mean, it was just, I figured it would automatically be bad. It's, it looks like Jennifer Lopez trying to be, you know, attainable. <laughs> and 
but now you're saying it's good. So that's that's awesome. You know, you want everything to be good. So it's not like I'm rooting no. for it to suck. I just skipped it because I thought it would suck. So to be fair, I had extra. I went into this thing thinking, yeah, knowing I was going to hate it. Like I had extraordinarily low. It was not a high bar for this to get over, considering you know Jennifer Lopez is, has a has a history of making really terrible romantic comedies. So it was not a high bar that this had to get over, but it gets over it because. This is such a clever casting. These two, you would not think would have this kind of romantic chemistry, but it turns out he's just what she needs. She is you know, a very over the top performer. She makes big decisions. She needs a good director to, to get her there. But uh, short of that, she just needs somebody who can ground her a little bit and make her seem normal. And Owen Wilson has this ability to be so charming and so laid back that he takes her OTT qualities and brings them down to earth in a way that is very fitting of this character, who is this pop star, who is the most famous woman in the world. She's uh, so famous that she's getting married on stage to her um, uh, would-be husband, Bastian, who's played by pop star Maluma. Uh, They're going to get married on stage after they sing their new hit song called Marry Me. Uh, but as she's about to go on stage and uh, she's dressed in this you know elaborate wedding gown, somebody shows her a video of Bastion cheating on her with her assistant. And so she goes up on stage and is kind of lost and confused and sad. And she gives this little speech and then she just looks out in the crowd and Owen Wilson just happens to be holding up a sign that says, marry me that belonged to his friend, uh, Sarah Silverman. And and she goes, yeah, you, I'll marry you. Yes. (laughs) And she brings him up on stage and they get married right then and there. Uh, Because he's trying to prove to his daughter that he can be spontaneous and fun. (laughs) And so he takes takes the opportunity. Um, And from there, it's just this kind of very unconventional romance. And it's an interesting thing. I watched this other movie this week um, that is also about a uh, a world famous actress who goes to this uh, resort and falls in love with the chef at the restaurant. And it's a very predictable romantic comedy in the vein of Notting Hill. And the thing about it is, is that the two actors who are the leads in that film just don't have it to make it more interesting. They don't have that chemistry to lift you beyond what is obvious about this plot, that they're going to end up together. Whereas Jennifer Lopez and Owen Wilson are watching this movie, and there's so much star power and so much charisma coming off the screen that, of course, you know where this is headed. You know where this is going, obviously, but it works because they're so charming together. He makes her so much better. And I got to give him just so much credit because considering the terrible fucking movies that she's made in this genre, I have to credit him and I have to credit, credit the director. Yeah. And I mean, we were making for me specifically, we're making, was making fun of Owen Wilson last week about not really being a star anymore. Uh, and in a way that probably helps here because she, they're stars in different ways. I mean, it doesn't get much more famous than Jennifer Lopez right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, even Beyonce and Jay Z are like, they're like a, almost so famous they're so off to the left that they're not even mainstream anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they're like the royal family, right? <laughs> and but she's just always on our face lately. The last few years, specifically, I mean, yeah. really for the last twenty five, thirty years, but really the last few years specifically. I mean, and a few years ago, she did that, or a couple of years ago, did that Hustlers movie where she was. I thought she's never been better. Yeah, uh, and it's similar to this in terms of at one point her characters. I mean, she's not famous in it, but she comes off and it clearly is the star of the movie. At the next, you know, at the end of the movie, she's working at Kohl's or something like that, and you buy it the whole time. And it's cool to see her having being in those relatable roles because that's. You know, the kind of the opposite of the Gal Gadot situation in the last movie. Yeah. Uh, the ha- to, to be able to bring Jennifer Lopez down to a relatable, uh, and that's not, that's more due to her fame than anything else mixed with her bad decisions, but the fame really helps with that. Yeah. Uh, that's a pretty impressive feat, I think. Yeah. Owen Wilson's really great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's on Peacock. Peacock. Yeah. I watched the Super Bowl it's also in theaters if you want to go to a movie theater and see it. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do we got next? Cosmic Dawn. 
Cosmic Dawn is the story of a woman who, as a child, she lost her mother. And she was there when her mother was abducted by aliens. Uh, she grows up to be, you know, desperate for answers, trying to figure out who she is and whatever happened to her mother. And she begins to see this woman uh, and starts to follow her. Uh, she doesn't know why she's following her, but she thinks this woman has some kind of information that she needs. She follows this woman into this bookstore where she meets a character, but played by Emmanuel Shariki, who shows her this book. And inside the book is a picture of the author. And the author is this woman she's been seeing everywhere. So she buys the book and she gets invited to this meeting. And it turns out it's for this cult that believes that aliens are going to be returning to Earth. Uh, so she joins the cult and she's going along. But the, all the while, the movie is shifting backwards and forwards in time in a way that is really unnecessary and really cuts away the, any kind of tension in the story that, that might be necessary to, to sell it. Uh, the movie can't decide if it's taking this premise seriously or if it's kind of if it's making a, a B movie sci fi picture. Some of the performances are very over the top and, and bordering on silly, like Emmanuel Shariki's performance, but then the main actress is just very bland and straightforward. The cult leader is going kind of up and down over the top and then. Uh, then you arrive at an ending that just kind of kind of leaves you just kind of scratching your head going, well, I still don't know what this was about. Uh, and it's very unsatisfying in that way. And uh, the, this I don't know if this I think it's the structure. I think structurally, this is just such a flawed structure to bounce back and forth in time where back in time she's in the cult. Then in further in time, she's out of the cult and she's trying to find the cult leader and potentially I don't know, kill her or just try to prove that she's not dead. Uh, I don't know. It, it was so, I was so annoyed that I just kind of gave up and played on my phone for about 15 minutes. So I might've missed something important because I was just, <laughs> I just didn't care at that point. I mean, the way things were shifting back and forth, it was just impossible for me to get invested. Your critique of this is making me want to fast forward the episode to a director who knows how to do handle these situations and do it right. Uh, uh, I wish I had to put him back to back. <laughs> Still got a ways to go before you get to those. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a cool enough poster, I guess. But even the poster, you can't quite tell if it's a B movie or a uh, yeah. serious. It's hard to tell what it is. There's a, Elements of you know seventies uh, drive-in sci-fi. There's elements mm. of very modern you know science fiction. This <laughs> is very straightforward. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. I don't know if you saw this one. I watched Kimmy on HBO Max, uh, the Steven Soderbergh film. Did you get to watch it at all? I did not. <clears throat> it's basically Kimmy is Alexa, more or less. Only people actually listen to it, so they can really pick pick up on what we're trying to ask Alexa to do. So uh, Zoe Kravitz is an agoraphobic uh, character who her job is being one of the Kimmies and listening in on stuff. And she thinks she hears a crime, you know, very rear window ish. Uh, the problem is <laughs> I, you know, there's a lot of, for, this is Steven Soderbergh. So I, I feel weird saying there's a problem, but just very convenient uh, a lot of things that happened in this movie and uh, you know we I don't think any of us want the government watching us but it, or anybody watching us, a corporation or whatever, but this movie kind of has us thinking maybe they should watch it, you know, and I don't think that's necessarily the way you want to go with it the ending so like go, wait did it get kind of push it too far and like it was it was talking about what a danger it was and then went too far into kind of advocating on behalf of it <laughs> Well, I mean, she basically hears a sexual assault happening, and, uh, she, and uh -huh. the corporation doesn't want her to act on it. The corporation is supposed to be the bad guy, but they're also not wanting her to act on it, and she works for the corporation, and it just kind of it spirals out of control, and you don't really know. Like, I feel like he's... I guess it does engross you enough where you can start to follow the story, but as soon as you get out of it and you start thinking about it, you're like, well... I mean, not that I want them avoiding sexual assault, but that's, you know, I, I don't want them listening in on me talking to a Siri or Alexa or whatever else. And, you know, and then you're thinking, well, maybe she's agoraphobic. Maybe she's got mental health issues. It is during COVID. 
that is relevant here. So uh, she's an unreliable narrator? So you're thinking that, but then it goes into the straight-ahead action movie ending, which, again, fun enough, I suppose, but I, I've either seen too many movies and I'm just picking apart for no reason. Uh, it's also Steven Soderbergh, so I unfairly probably hold him to a higher standard. Uh, everything is competent. It was just kind of like, I don't know. It, it just wasn't really for me. Uh, again, the ending's too clean and just, it again, works for an action movie, but I, I still just, I find myself sipping out going, well, really the corporation is the good guy here for what we really all want. <laughs> and like universally, we all seem to want that. Uh, and they're, yeah, and they just kind of twisted the story around. To, I don't know to make us feel bad for wanting that, or or <laughs> give us a devil's advocate approach to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not for sexual assault by any means, obviously. Uh, but I was thinking maybe they were going to play a mental health game with it, and they they flirt with it, but they don't, they don't fully go there. So I don't know. Uh, she does have sex in it. I know Steven Soderbergh cares a lot about that. So uh, <laughs> isn't that what? <laughs> His critique of superhero movies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody's having sex. There's no fucking in the Marvel movies. But there's yeah. fucking in my movies, damn it. Yeah, especially with my agoraphobic <laughs> characters. <laughs> Again, competent. Just I, It's yeah. one of those you see too many movies. That, uh, like, I'm not surprised you skipped it. I would have. I, I, the only reason I didn't skip it was because I didn't want to do two foreign films back to back at work. Uh so I did this one instead and did the other one on the treadmill. Anyway, uh, I would say it's safe to skip this one. Unless you're just a Steven Soderbergh completist, then to each their own. Uh, let's move on and talk about Shapeless. Shapeless is a horror film about a woman who has a eating disorder. She is bulimic. And uh, what she does is she just, every night when she comes home, she loads up with food and then she goes and she pukes it all out. And then uh, she wakes up the next day and starts everything over again. Slowly, but surely she's starting to kind of have these visions of herself where like pieces of herself are falling off. And maybe perhaps there's some sort of demon inside of her that is trying to get out, that is pushing out parts of herself and replacing her with parts of itself. uh, The demon part. A uh, very interesting way to portray a a eating disorder, and it's a really, really fascinating movie. It's also so dark at times that you really, I think, I'm I'm missing parts of the movie because it's so dark. And I mean, in terms of coloring, <laughs> like I couldn't see some of the things that were happening that were, I'm assuming, were supposed to be expressions of what the demon was doing. Uh, she's a nightclub singer. She she sings really well until, of course. She's been throwing up a lot and starting to take a toll on her voice and to uh, also to cover up for her, you know, to cover up for that. She started drinking. So she's becoming uh, a bit of an alcoholic, which is making her unreliable. She's falling apart at gigs. And then it arrives at this scene where her band, she and her band are performing at a wedding. And she's just kind of she's a little bit drunk and, and very hungry. And they, and she can't sing anymore. Like she's just uh, incapable of hitting the notes. And so they just tell her to leave. And she goes in the house, and there's the wedding cake. And you're you're just your heart drops. Everything drops in that moment. It is so hard to watch because you know what she's probably going to do to that wedding cake. And I I almost had to turn it off. It was that level of visceral like fear and identification i i i don't have the kind of eating disorder that she has but i certainly do have some some pretty severe uh food issues Uh, i don't have bulimia but i do have like very severe issues related to food emotional issues related Mm -hmm. to food and seeing that enacted here in the way it is is very very triggering and uh but that's also it's also incredibly effective in that way um I wish I could have seen more of the movie, but in terms of just how dark it is, like there's just nothing I could do to to make it look any better, Uh, you know, adjusting anything I could to try and actually see anything. Some of the scenes are just shot so darkly that you can't make out what's happening. 
Uh, I do. But the one thing I got to say about this movie that, that is really interesting is that days don't seem to end and or begin. They just her when you're in what she's in, in terms of bulimia and in terms of her eating disorder and it's just the days run into each other. And the way this movie captures that is so beautifully. It's just the days just seem to roll and everything happens again and again. She's at the bar. She's singing. She's at home binging and purging. She's in the bath. She wakes up the next day. She goes to her job. She's late to work. She's having kind of you know the day just sort of sliding by. And then she's back at the bar. And it all just keeps happening in this melange where it doesn't seem to be edited. It just seems to be just sort of happening in a circle. And that routine is so is so perfect a way to express what she's going through because this is just this we all think of eating disorders as being this big dramatic thing, but for the person having them, this is just their life. This is just the routine. I eat as much junk as I can, I feel horrible about it, and then I throw it up again and I start all over again. The cycle begins again every single day. And this movie doesn't have an answer it doesn't it's not going to try and you know redeem her or save her it's just presenting it and that's going to begin it's it's dark in that way just how this routine never ends yeah even you just talking about it has me feeling like because i think we kind of share a similar (laughs) eating disorder (laughs) especially the emotional part of it yeah Uh, i definitely can relate to that and just you talking about that scene has me kind of not even wanting you to go on. <laughs> uh, I do wonder if they shot it dark because when you're dealing with an eating disorder, you're dealing with probably ultra skinny people and uh, you don't want the actress to <laughs> lose too much weight. And maybe yeah. they shot her so dark you couldn't really tell what was going on. But at Perhaps. the same time, you can't tell what's going on. So. Uh, but it sounds effective nonetheless. So it is. It is. It's it's very very effective. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my particular eating disorder. I, I get very emotional about food. I get very emotional about it, and uh, it causes me to do things t- with food that I uh, then I get ashamed of it, and that shame becomes depression, and then it becomes that's the cycle. <laughs> I, I mean, I understand. Like if like I remember being as a kid. And just eating pizza rolls my dad had. And then he came home and was like, hey, wait, the pizza rolls. And I just felt terrible. Like, like I ruined his day. And I don't think he, I mean, he was just like, go get some later. You know, it's not a big deal. It wasn't <laughs> like he didn't yell at me. Yeah. But it's those little, I mean, it's the stupidest thing. But I, you know, I was like seven and it still stays with me, you know, 35 years later. Uh, and I have a million stories like that. And I, you were talking about a movie about what Brittany runs a marathon or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I totally oh God, yeah. related to everything you said when that movie came out. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, I just, I don't know. I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. It just, it's very eye opening. I suppose is the phrase I'm looking for. <sighs> anyway, <laughs> Uh, let's move on to Catch the Fair One. Catch the Fair One is a movie starring Kelly Reese, who's a real life uh, MMA fighter and MMA champion fighter. Uh, in this movie, she plays an MMA fighter who loses everything and uh, and especially loses everything after her little sister is uh, is kidnapped and sold into human trafficking. Uh, in order to try and track her down and see if she can get her back, she decides to put herself into this world of human trafficking and uh, she tries and she's basically trying to use the skills that she learned when she was in prison for a brief time to keep herself safe and use her MMA training to try and you know battle back against these guys who took her sister and see if she can try and track her down it's an incredibly this one's an emotionally dark movie but uh, obviously human trafficking is not a uh, is not a happy topic. Right. Uh, this movie takes it very seriously and uh, treats it with a great deal of seriousness. It's not just about uh, you know a, a badass woman who's kicking everybody's ass, even though she does kick some ass in this movie. Uh, she she goes to some very dark places and uh, has to do things that uh, that are you know incredibly awful in order to get to where she wants to get to. Uh, and then she does some very violent things and, and uh, willingly hap- you know, professionally kills people to try and get where she's going 
to try and save her sister. It's a it's a bold movie. It's an incredibly well made movie. Kelly Reese is a, ve- a very effective star, uh, mostly because she's not a star. She's not an actor. She's just she's acting purely on instinct, uh, kind of the way a fighter would perform. And that's kind of what works for this role is that she's not an actor. She you don't you don't see her acting you don't see her searching for her motivation in any scene she's a fighter she's being you know fought against by people she's being punched by people and she's reacting to it and you know she's strategizing and how she's going to hit back and that's really what makes this movie so powerful and compelling yeah i mean that is a lot to say though to be able to be yourself and to play that and not and just be you know it's it's very hard. I mean, I can't do it. I mean, I can do it on a podcast, I suppose. But even then, I feel like I'm, you know, trying to be likable or whatever. But, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I know just being a zombie, my like a nameless zombie in the background of my brother's movie, it was hard to do anything. Uh, I just, you know, you immediately freeze up. And you hear that a lot about people who don't know what they're doing. So, And you see it in a lot of movies for non-actors. You can tell when a non-actress on the screen a lot of times. So I think that's really cool that she was able to, you know, be herself and make it work. That's pretty impressive in my book. Yeah. Yeah, And I think that's, I think the approach of, I I don't know if the director told her this or not, but just treat it like a fight, like a real fight. (laughs) Treat every scene like you're, like you have to win the scene. That's kind of how she approaches it. And it, it really works it really works for this role on top of which there's this other element uh, that if you've seen them, if you've seen the movie wind river, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that uh, at the end of that movie, there's this sucker punch of an ending that tells you the number of native American women who just go missing and no one knows what happened to them. Uh, and that's, she's, uh, she's part native American. Her sister is a native American. And that's kind of an undercurrent to the whole thing is that, so many Native American women go missing every year and they're never on the news and no one ever talks about them. Yeah. It's awful. Uh, does a razor blade or is that a razor blade on the cover? That, that is a razor blade. It that, definitely comes into play. Jeez. Yeah. Is this a, I'm assuming it's streaming right now. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it's from IFC. It seems very... Hard to watch or good? It's tough. Or? It's a tough movie. Like there's no, there's no light. There's no humor. There's nothing that's going to leaven the moment. It's completely straight ahead, serious throughout, and that's going to be hard for a lot of people. But it, but it is a, an incredible movie. Okay, let's move on to a much lighter movie. <laughs> <laughs> Big Bug from director Jean Pierre Junot. You know. I love this director. He's my favorite director in many ways because he's directed so many wonderful films, Amelie, and of course our classic tonight. And uh, but this, I have absolutely no idea what this is. I don't know what he's trying to do here. And I just, I gave up about halfway through. I just quit because I really just didn't understand this movie at all. Uh, the story if I can try to, to describe it, it's a future world where robots are in charge, I guess, and they, they provide everything you want to, at any moment for any reason. Um, this woman has a guy over at her house and her ex-husband and his wife show up and, his, and her daughter and there's this guy who's there who's got his son there and then their neighbor comes over and then somehow they end up locked in the house because something's happening outside and the house has this notion to protect all the people inside. So it locks itself and uh, keeps everybody there and just weird shit just keeps happening. Uh, people keep trying to have sex and failing to have sex. And then some people do have sex. And then I don't know. It, it's very colorful. It's incredibly inventive. But I I really hated this. I didn't have a good time watching this at all. I, I just could not find my way into what the point of this was. Yeah, I couldn't tell you the point. Uh, I mean, something about a meteor had struck and the robots are trying to protect the people so they won't let them out. Was, I guess the point's like AI gone awry. Uh, so 
at the so there's that and uh it's not the most <clears throat> friendly movie to watch but at the same time i like his style i like the mm-hmm. way it looks uh it's it took inventive me, it took me a few sittings to go through oh i did make it through uh yeah but you know it's I don't know. It, it's I mean, I'll take its originality, I guess, uh, or taking a. I mean, the AI gone wrong is not original, but taking that and making something original out of it. Again, not it's not something I'm just going to watch for fun. I'll never watch this again. I, you know, no. it's not going to be Amelie or Delicatessen or our classic. But it does. I mean, it looks. It has a same similar shooting style to those movies. Delicatessen more than the other three. But they all kind of have a weird, unique shooting style, which then makes me wonder, like, I never saw his Alien movie, but I can't imagine Alien being shot in these weird, uh, (laughs) which makes me somewhat curious, although I'm sure the studio didn't allow for any of that. Right. Uh, It's hard to, it's really hard to think what he saw in Alien and what they saw in him making an Alien movie, considering what we know about him and his movies. It's a very odd combination to say the least yeah did you make it to the one that alien in the background got into the screen or that no. robot not the alien that robot <laughs> behind the people on the poster oh yeah yeah, yeah okay because yeah i mean i i don't know i i didn't mind i watched it. the whole movie oh i, I watched it <laughs> yeah no i watched the whole thing uh, i i was just frustrated and annoyed the whole time uh, like I said, I just uh, I was waiting for the point to emerge. <laughs> I was right. waiting for the purpose to emerge, and it just it just never did. Uh, I don't know what he was trying to say. I I never laughed. It's not funny. It's not romantic. It's weird for the sake of weird, and it feels just completely up his own ass. Well, then when you throw another language on it, for me, I'm not trying. Well, this is my <laughs> weird. I watched it in English. Well, so did I. <laughs> Uh, but still it was like when I look at the movies I like of his there's a central character they're ensembles but you have one character that you're following here it's more of an ensemble only and I just had a harder time following it I guess is more what I think the problem is at the same time I mean maybe if I was uh, French it would have been the best movie ever I don't know Uh, I don't know which character are you supposed to invest in? Like, which is the character right. you're supposed to care about? Uh, the wife didn't do anything for me. She wasn't particularly interesting to me at all. None of the characters were, though. The ki- the ki- the two kids, kind of. But you're missing uh, the Audrey the, tattoo, you know, or yeah. you're missing her, that central focus of the movie. Uh, or even the, the butcher and delicatessen or the guy he's trying to butch, butcher up. <laughs> Uh, one of the, you, you don't have you just have every character is kind of equal, and uh, and I just I got lost in it a lot. Uh, I there's a see, there's a thread going throughout. There's a there's this character who's there trying to have a date with the the the, the, fe- the lead female character, and uh, throughout he's just he's just really ha- trying very hard to get laid. And then when he's just about to do it, he says suddenly turns and goes, no, I don't want it. It's too much. All of this is too much. And you're like, where the fuck did this come from? Like, I get it after he gets what he wants and then he leaves like he's an asshole. Fine. But for him to stop on a dime and not get not go for the thing that he wants, he's been pushing for the entire movie. It just felt like a just random choice. And there's so many of those random choices throughout. Like there's a hardcore sex scene at one point. You're like, where the fuck did that come from? Right. what is happening and then there's these robots who they're like the house robots and they want to be human but but then why are they are they i don't know i don't get any of it yeah the one thing i will say that does work not even works not the right word but good direction i suppose you know what you're complaining about with cosmic dawn where it seemed like different actors were in different movies all these actors were in the same movie (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, if nothing else, he had that going. And, you know, all the other movies, Amelie and Delicatessen and uh, The City of Lost Children and The Very Long Engagement, they're all like that. You know, they have a weird kind of heightened, only almost unique reality, and they all w- live within that world. Uh, 
this definitely isn't delicatessen and I think it wants to be like that in a sci-fi kind of way uh, I don't know does he have a thing with April Fool's jokes or is that <laughs> does he do like that in every movie or something or I don't know maybe I, I've never really clocked it well I, I just noticed it in here and then also in yeah. a very long engagement I was like that's <laughs> weird <clears throat> but anyway let's go to a very long engagement because that's way yes. better uh, such a such a beautiful movie uh, this is uh, Jean-Pierre Junet doing his own sort of uh, black and white epic romance. Not black and white, but it kind of has his, it's kind of his take on what black and white looks like, which is kind of a great way to, to approach it. And it's just a gorgeous looking movie. The story progresses that a young man is sent to the front in, in World War One, likely sent to specifically to his death because the you know, the, the trench warfare in World War One, especially at the front where he was fighting, it just seems like there's no hope whatsoever. And he's and Jude is very, you know, very honest and allows those scenes to be incredibly grim when he shows them. Uh, back home, Audrey Tattoo is the the uh, girlfriend or fiance of this young man. And she's just desperate to know anything about him. Where is he? Is he alive? Is he dead? Uh, and, and she's going on this, you know, journey to try and find out what happened to him where is he is he alive or dead and it's such a beautiful epic romantic sweeping thing that also just happens to have this uh sense of humor and romance that is specific to jean-pierre junet like you just know that this is him and this is the way he makes movies and uh even when he's doing something like you know scenes of war he's doing it in a way that he does it not the way anybody else does it <laughs> And, uh, he approaches it the same way with the, the this ro- the way he portrays romance is just it's his idea his very specific vision of what a romance is and that's just it's just beautiful and then on top of that you've just got this incredible cinematography the look is so original and unique the setting is you know, this you know early 20th century setting but it's unlike any early 20th century setting it feels like it feels authentic and yet it feels like jude <laughs> just i just love this movie i love this guy this movie is like well over two hours long it never feels like it for one second it just it's a movie that just floats by it's so weird because you describe this movie about a widow or a potential widow trying to search for her long lost soldier fiance uh, it sounds very boring. <laughs> uh, and so then you look at the runtime and there's just nothing appealing about what this movie sounds like it's going to be. But then you watch it and you're hundred percent right. Uh, it's just, it's like the right amount of quirk. It's his own unique. And he has it in all of his movies. Uh, the war scenes remind me very much of delicatessen. and the love scenes are very, om- I mean, he definitely, I don't know. He just has a very unique way of shooting but it's as wholly his own. And I can see, you can just tell he made this movie uh, while it's its own thing at the same time. Uh, And I mean, his use of farts and poop and stuff like that, he has it in here and it's not like Adam Sandler ish juvenile. Like he somehow makes a juvenile concept or juvenile joke just fit in. Uh, It really is. Did this win any awards? This had to win like best foreign picture, didn't it? It was be- it was nominated for sure. I don't know if it won, but it was certainly nominated. It deserved best picture. I mean, it was the 2004. This movie belonged in the best picture race. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the way you, uh, the way Drive My Car is there now. You know, this one should have been one of the fir- one of those rare foreign films to get a best picture nomination because it is just that good. It's just so beautiful and romantic and different like it just it's unlike any movie of its kind and yet it sounds like it could be anything like a dozen movies from the 1940s to the 1970s well yeah i mean this could be as boring as the english patient if the wrong person made it <laughs> right uh and let's not you know forget about audrey tattoo because she is amazing in this movie i mean everybody's amazing in it but yeah uh, she really does hold this movie together, and I think when his best movies are when he has that central character to re- revolve around. Uh, you also have uh, oh, what's her name, Marion Cotillard. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, Marion Cotillard. She is phenomenal in this. Jodie Foster pops up. I'm like, what the fuck is she doing in this movie? <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
uh, you have the kind of the protagonist and from delicatessen in it as the kind of carekeeper uh, caretaker of her character I, I the whole thing was just it was just so watchable and interesting and entertaining and it didn't had no reason to be this good and which yeah. really makes it probably his best you know I, yeah i mean i i still love i think I, it's right there with amelie yeah. like the two are just they're just neck and neck for me when it comes to his to his best work uh the way he uses her face just the her eyes are so expressive and and you're just you're just lost in them at times just the 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 pain the sorrow the 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 joy that she's you know the romance the love you can see it all play across her face so beautifully he captures that beautifully and i i I know she's done other things outside of his work but so many people have lost yeah do not use her properly (laughs) you know yeah (laughs) Uh, to me she should be one of those crossover actresses that should be as famous as anybody else you know she's as good as you know what you know a young scarlett johansson and you know uh, lost in translation or even jennifer lawrence in her early stuff winner's bone uh i don't know why she's not you know as popular as them in the mainstream uh because she is that good i mean just elevates these movies to a level that not many people can. And she deserves to be, you know, treated like those other actresses. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know what it is. Maybe she just doesn't like working outside of France. I'm not sure. Maybe. Uh, that, but she was in a uh, terrible Lebowski sequel and it wasn't her fault. It was uh, a total yeah. Waste of her. Yeah. That movie is a total waste of everything. <laughs> Yeah, but if you haven't seen a very long engagement, I highly recommend it. I mean, if you really, you know, Amelie, this delicatessen, I haven't seen the City of Lost Children. I don't think. Uh, no, it's got to go on the list though. Absolutely, <laughs> but I mean, it, it's worth. I haven't been disappointed. I mean, Big Bug was a little weird. I definitely wouldn't stop yeah. there. Uh, I don't plan no. on going back either. Uh, but these are. You can't miss. I really don't know how you would dislike any Amelie or this or Delicatessen. No, the the, the right of Amelie to this is just so few few directors can can claim that kind of back to back triumph. Right. Just and then even like the gross stuff, he, like he films it and puts it in these movies. Like I mean, they get killed, they fall in the mud, and they go in. I mean, it's yeah. But He's not playing around. But it, it just it works with the movies. I mean, I don't know. Just really, really impressive, and I couldn't recommend this movie more. I'm glad we did it. <laughs> I feel my idea, but I know you've been talking about this movie forever. Uh, so yeah. glad I finally got to it. Uh, Wayne's World turns 30. Yes, it does, and I love Wayne's World. And what a surprise to find that this movie holds up so very, very well. Uh, Because I was really kind of dreading this, you know, because what we know about Mike Mike Myers now and how weird he is. And even Dana Carvey's kind of getting a little weird in his older age. And uh, just thinking about that, I was kind of worried that maybe that might uh, make me forget just how much I loved this movie. But no, right off the bat, the first few minutes, (laughs) it just it was a time machine. Just the second I hear the the second I hear him say swing, I'm like, I'm back in. I'm in now. Let's keep going. I want I want more. And just it's just so, so much fun. It's so good hearted. It's so sweet. These characters truly love each other and they you can just they, they, it just radiates off the screen how much excitement and fun they're having and of course penelope spheris is, is a wonderful director for this material just capturing the the both the heightened over the top you know saturday night live jokes and yet these wonderfully sweet characters who you just really enjoy watching uh even if even if tina career is like fifty thousand times out of mike myers you know attractiveness level like it's like it's almost like Kevin James sitcom level of absurd that he's with her. I still buy it because he's just such a sweet guy. And uh, <laughs> Wayne is anyway. And, right. uh, I love this. I, re- I really thought I was I really didn't think this was going to hold up as well as it did. But I had such a great time watching this. Well, you got Mike Myers love for this character and the content. Then you bring in Penelope to direct it and really ground him. Uh, I know they fought a lot while they made it, but. A lot of these, you know, 
guy jokes that you know don't necessarily hold up anymore uh she found a way to make it harmless and uh make these characters pathetic enough where it's not offensive you know 30 years later which is really impressive because a lot of these movies that came out of this kind of same vein do not hold up like well enough uh but this is just this was so much fun it's not even funny uh it is funny, actually. My son watched it with it, and like he's ready to be Garth for Halloween already. <laughs> uh, my wife's like, "You can be Wayne if you want." And he's like, "No, I want to be Garth." <laughs> uh, he's running. Around, he's been on. Not kidding. Singing that Wayne's World song almost nonstop since he's been watching it to the point my wife's like, y- "You say it again, you're taking your phone away." <laughs> uh, And she also said her favorite joke was in this movie, and she got in a lot of trouble with her parents when she said it to them. uh, She didn't understand it. And so the whole time he kept going, is that the joke? Is that the joke? (laughs) Uh, And it was when they ordered, when he wanted to order cream with some young guy. Uh, (laughs) We never really went into that with him, but he, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. It's just so well cast and... Uh, it knows what it is. It stays in its yeah. lane. It has fun. Uh, great Rob Lowe performance. He's so he's so smart. <laughs> he's so great at it too. Talk about an actor that knows what he does well. You know. Oh yeah. You know he's never going to win an Oscar, but he's going to play that Rob Lowe character perfect every time he does it. Yeah, uh, like this one in Tommy Boy. He's he's the he's the best thing, in, arguably in Tommy Boy. <laughs> like, he's just so funny. Right. <laughs> Uh yeah, I and then I mean they do it all the time. Effortless. The, it's effortless for him. The Alice Cooper scene, I love when he just they sit there and it just gets so serious and they just, uh really walk a. <laughs> <laughs> and then the multiple endings uh you know, it's just not to Let's mention the super happy ending. Right. Not to mention the Bohemian Rhapsody scene, like one of the best scenes in the history of film, especially when it comes to this fun stuff, you know, these everyday yeah. watchable movies. Uh, just everybody involved did the perfect. I mean, Ed O'Neill. <laughs> it's hilarious in it. It's just him walking away with the camera for the first time. <laughs> just right. and just monologuing straight to the camera. It's just fucking great. Just, just completely throwaway scene. It has nothing to do with the movie, but it's just so smart. <laughs> Yeah, just not an ounce of fat, just a lot of fun. Uh, you know, really making these two bigger stars than they ever be, would have been. They also locked them together forever, whether they wanted to be or not. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's. I'm, I'm really pleased that it held up. Uh, I know Wayne's World 2 is not quite as good. It's just more of a recreation of this. And so it was, what's the point? I liked it, but, you know, it's not Wayne's World. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've been to Aurora just kind of drive around looking to see <laughs> any of the <laughs> landmarks are there. Uh, yeah, it's uh, I don't know who hasn't seen it, but the, I think it's worth showing your kids. It's I know a lot of my friends did. So uh, it's 30. It, we're old. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a trip. You know, it's this is one of those one of those time travel movies. You're a kid again watching this movie you just are it's just one of those things it's a it's a benchmark of my by being a 16 year old is this movie and i i just go right back there watching this movie being you know just having a massive crush on tia Carrere and (laughs) singing along with bohemian rhapsody like it's just the best oh i mean i you know i was 12 and i probably spent 14 to 20 trying to find everything t- Tia Carrere did because she was so hot in this movie. Uh, yeah, it, it's... I don't know. It just... It was a good weekend, is all I'm going to say. that You know, that's not a lot of times do these movies actually hold up and work. Uh, and this does, and that makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This one definitely holds up. <clears throat> all right. Next week... We've got Dog, Uncharted, Strawberry Mansions, and A Banquet. Our classic is the John Carpenter film Prince of Darkness. Uh, I think that's when, right after his more famous movies, it's kind of like his last, 
either his last good one or his first bad one, depending on how you, <laughs> you rate him. In <laughs> uh, 1992, we got Falling from Grace, Radio Flyer, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, and This Is My Life. Uh, mm. They knew Wayne's World was coming out the week before, <laughs> so they just dumped all their other movies this week. Yeah. Uh yeah, so that is our show. Uh, head over to patreon.com slash critics pod if you want to be a get a credit on the show. Uh, T public at ihatecritics.net. Don't forget to subscribe to us, rate and review the show. Read we will read your reviews on the air. Uh, but for now, let's go play flick chart, and we will start with a Little Mermaid or an American Gangster. Which way are you going? Little Mermaid. Uh, yeah, I'll go there. Only because American Gangster should have been better. Yeah, that's true. I do like it, but not good enough. What the fuck? <laughs> Letters from Iwo Jima or Coneheads? Coneheads. Total guilty pleasure in that movie. Especially Chris Farley is one of the... Just, I think he's funniest in that movie than he is anywhere else. I just think he's hilarious in that movie. Well, he was awesome in Wayne's World, too. I totally forgot he was yeah. in it. And <laughs> that was a great scene. Again, like just the little cinematic touches in, in Wayne's World. Like like this, just this guy who gives them totally you know, needed information for later. And, they all, and they're just totally playing it beautifully. It's very surreal and, and just very funny. And as much as that's been copied from over the years, I mean, Sandler's done it a million times, and it never works the same. Like, I figured that that wouldn't play as well because of how many times it's been ripped off, but it it still felt fresh. Even the product placement jokes were so much better in here than in any other movie that's tried to do it since. Uh, yeah. Uh, just So skillful. So clever. Yeah. All right. Sweet Home Alabama or Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. I hate Sweet Home Alabama so much. The Stepford Wives, Insidious. Insidious. Agreed. That was the remake of The Stepford Wives, by the way. Pitch Perfect or Shrek Forever After? Uh, uh. That's a lesser Shrek, but I actually like the Pitch Perfect sequel more than I like the Pitch Perfect movie. I agree, but I this was a bad Shrek. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Which way are you going? I'm going Pitch Perfect. Yeah, I'll go uh, with you. Because at least laid the groundwork. Capturing the Freedmen's. You've seen that one? Oh yeah. All right. That. Hell, of, you gotta see. You gotta see that if you haven't seen. If you haven't seen that. You gotta see it. I will have to see that then. I have not seen it. I'm assuming it's better than Rambo 3, though. Yeah, that's not too hard to be better than Rambo 3. Weekend at Bernie's Broken Arrow. <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> they're, both, they're both terrible, in the, but they're terrible in that really, really watchable way. Oh, man. Like... Ah, uh, I don't know. I, Broken Arrow? Yeah, see, for me with Broken Arrow, I know it's... like That's when I was realized that John Travolta really wasn't that great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of heartbreaking, so I wasn't able to have that. And I, I've never gone back to have fun with it. Yeah. Uh, but it was more like disappointing, like, oh, he's not this awesome actor from Paul that Quentin Tarantino brought back to us. Uh, then again, weekend at Bernie's. All I remember is a dead guy walking around. I'll flip it. Broken Arrow, it is. Funny Games, Short Circuit. I've not seen Funny Games. I saw the original, but I didn't see the remake. I think this is the original. No, the original is French. Yeah, look at it. The poster is uh, that's the poster. That, that's Michael Pitt in the, in the poster and Tim Roth. Uh, so that's not the French original. All right. Well, the French original or short circuit. <laughs> uh, do you like funny games? Uh, I was all right. Uh, yeah, I thought you tried a little too hard. Yeah. Uh, Jurassic World short circuit. Can't remember if Jurassic World is the one I liked. I think I liked it. We liked, I like it. We liked it at the time. Yeah, let's go with that. Josh hated it. 
all the more reason to pick it. Uh, the Wolf of Wall Street, Chinatown. Chinatown. Yes. Speed Racer, Kiki. No. Nope. Never. No. Speed Racer, Leaving Las Vegas. That's tough. That is so tough. They're so different, but I love them both. Oh, man. Um, That's really Leaving hard. Las Vegas. Yeah. Yeah, because it's like weird. I'd probably watch Speed Racer first because it's less homework, but not but Leaving Las Vegas is homework. But the performances are so great, and it's it's one of those movies that's better that still, even if I wouldn't watch it first, I'd pick it. <laughs> I don't know. That doesn't make, doesn't make any sense. All right. <laughs> Marie Antoinette, The Craft. Marie Antoinette. Agreed. I think people are going to watch Marie Antoinette again after Kirsten Dunst perhaps wins an Oscar and you'll know, maybe see that movie just a little bit differently. Uh, yeah, it's it's Sofia Coppola. And it's, it's actually really brilliant, but a lot of people wrote it off at the time because they didn't take Kirsten Dunst seriously. Right. No, I remember loving it when I saw it, but I do feel like I got dismissed, right? Because it was oh, absolutely. Was that her follow up to Lost Translation, or was it maybe that was two or three movies later? Uh, yeah, I can't remember exactly which either that or somewhere was the follow up, but I can't remember which one came first. Yeah, the Babadook, Big Mama's House, the Babadook, obviously. Yeah, the Karate Kid <laughs> Part Three, Pride and Prejudice. Pride and Prejudice. This isn't fair. <laughs> like, I love this one more than Karate Kid. <laughs> I want to argue with you. Uh, Manhattan, Dead Man Walking. Manhattan. I wish I knew who directed Manhattan. I forgot. <laughs> uh, Flight Plan, The Jackal. Flight Plan. They both suck really bad. Yeah. Lady I've not seen the 1955 Lady Killers. I only saw the Coen Brothers one. Right, Brother Bear, I love you, man. I love you, man. Yeah, yeah Paul Rudd had the best Super Bowl commercial uh, as far as I'm concerned. That Seth was Ro- hilarious. Him and him Seth, Seth Rogen. Yes. <laughs> never seen a movie you're in. Even the ones we're in together? <laughs> <laughs> he marries the fucking demon that was living in his house. Oh man, that was such a great twist. I mean, I, a, it, was a, it was a journey. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's no sense in them doing this, but they should do a movie every year. Uh, it would probably get boring, and maybe we have that Ryan Reynolds factor. I don't know, but uh, their their chemistry is as good, if not better, than anybody else <laughs> ever. Very true. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've not seen Dark Hoser. I don't know what that is. I don't either. It looks like a Lego Batman Lego movie. But... Batman. Oh, this will be fun. High Fidelity <laughs> or Martles, Martyrs. Oh, my God. Both those movies are fucking incredible. Oh, what? I I, mean, I got to go with my heart and say High Fidelity, but I love Martyrs. Yeah, and I got to go the other direction, but I love High Fidelity. Uh, I just tend to go fucked up more than I go hard. <laughs> and High Fidelity is the winner. I don't feel bad about that because I love High Fidelity. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Oh, for fuck's sake. Oh, yeah. Harry Potter shit or Lord of the Rings shit? <laughs> Harry Potter shit. <laughs> All right. Down to Earth, Dunkirk. Uh. Um, Down to Earth's not bad, but I, I, Dunkirk's a better movie, just objectively. <laughs> I know, but it's also... <laughs> it's, a lot of Christopher Nolan bullshit? Yeah. <laughs> like, if, if even if, as much as Spielberg can drive me nuts, if he had done it, it it's a better movie, even. You know, and if you throw in... I don't know, it, it's just... It's almost worse because it's Christopher Nolan, but it, I know I understand Down to Earth is just a throwaway comedy. It's an entertaining throwaway comedy, but nonetheless, it's a throwaway comedy. Uh, we'll go Dunkirk. Animal House or Adam's Family Values? Uh, Animal House. Though I don't hate Adam's Family. Yeah. Clueless Maverick. Clueless. Agreed. Uh, 
Species 2, the Amityville Horror remake with Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> oh, they both they both suck. They both, they're both just just unwatchable piles of crap. Uh, but she's really hot, so Species 2. <laughs> Ryan Reynolds is really hot. Is this, is this was it the first one or the second one where she kisses a guy and her pushes her tongue right through his skull? Is that the first one? I don't remember. Uh just but, for that, I'll give it to that movie. Because like, <laughs> Amityville is just such a, it was just such a dreary, boring, colorless reha- rehashing of everything you've seen before. Right, I, they've never done the Amityville good, and not that you could at this point because we know too not much about you know the Warrens. But as a kid reading the book, I was so like, "This is amazing! How can you mess this up?" And nobody's even come close to doing it right. So, uh, sure. Natasha Henstridge is that her name? <laughs> I'll go with that. Uh, let's pick a real movie. Jaws Two: Idiocracy. Uh, I've got a big problem with Idiocracy, and just that it it's got such a big target. And I know that that like some of it continues to come through, and maybe in the, in the future it'll even be, it'll feel even more truthful. But it just it it just doesn't hit right with me. Still, Jaws two is a great, but it does have Roy Scheider. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, to me, Idiocracy is like the opposite of the Dunkirk. Oh, I know you're not that. Maybe the exact same problem as Dunkirk. It's like. It's all there, just might judge. I don't know. It, it's not as tight as Office Space. There's not enough humor that makes it rewatchable for me. I mean, it, I like the idea. I think it takes easy shots as opposed to the you be be a little bit smarter about it. Yeah, and I, I don't think the execution was great either. Maybe the whole thing about the time traveler. Being, the, you know, the regular guy, being the smartest guy in the world, was maybe that was a bad approach. But the idea of what the future was, I I don't know. I, I like Mike Judge a lot, but that's not <laughs> – I'm just not going to pick. Is that okay? That's a, Terry, it's, a great, it's a great Terry Crews performance. Terry Crews as the president, that is the best part of that movie. <laughs> right, but it's just such a clusterfuck. <laughs> What's his name? Mountain Dew something or other? <laughs> All right, it's basically playing Hulk Hogan. Oh, we'll flip for it. Who cares? Josh Dressed too. like Apollo Creed at the <laughs> White House. Like it's just such a great performance. All right, Josh two one though. Uh, Rango or the Ring? Rango. I do appreciate the Ring, but Rango is a really good movie. Waiting thirty days of night. Thirty days of night. Yeah. Waiting just doesn't hold up. I haven't really revisited it, but I remember even in the moment, there was just things that it was kind of like the lesser comedy compared to some other ones. Yeah. Birdman, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Eternal Sunshine, but uh, I do love I love Birdman. Birdman's amazing. Absolutely. Is it Saturday Night? Is that a it's a, it's a TV documentary about Saturday Night Live? <laughs> make this more fun ah oh, god damn it glory or dances with wolves we can end it here i don't give a shit glory Glory's shorter glory wins <laughs> end of the podcast all right <laughs> see you next week see ya bye